kick off with uh, a few thoughts on deep time. This uh, kind of a uh, concept borrowed from uh, Siegfried Zlinski, offering an alternative history of t media and technology by applying non-human time frames and scales that let us think, think about the hidden material and archaeological side of media. These presentations pose different perspectives on how our technological culture is connected to the Earth's history, geological formations, and ecological processes. So I'd like to kick off with our first speaker, uh, Yusi Parika, a professor at Winchester School of Art and author of numerous books, including the infamous Insect Media. Welcome, Yusi. Um, I wish I could say now that that's not the only infamous thing I do, um, but I won't go into um, other infamous things. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much, organizers, for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure. Um, not because of, you know, not only because that you invite me to talk, also because I was able to see the exhibition or exhibitions and hear other speakers as well. So there's a lot of really already very specialist speakers about the topic. So mine is more of a generic take on some of the backgrounds of why we talk about and how we can talk about and how we can perhaps radicalize the notion of the alchemy or alchemist in relation to um, deep times of contemporary technological culture. So basically, I think, despite being infamous with inset media, one of the reasons why I was um, invited to speak is because of my book, Geology of Media. Geology of Media was sort of a way of trying to pitch um, media theory of geophysics, uh, media theoretical um, elements of uh, geophysical underpinning of contemporary technological culture. But it did that in relation to artistic practices for various reasons. Because I think methodologically artistic practices, like a lot of people who are speaking over the days here or exhibiting today um, over the, you know, days here as well, have been the ones who really give us a way to think about this extended continuum between the technological and the geophysical as well. And I think besides the actual artworks, I think methodologically it's super interesting. Deep Time by Zielinski was already mentioned. And in a way, my book was already a sort of a nod to Deep Times by Zielinski, these sort of a weird histories of things that were forgotten, alchemists, other weird ideas from the history that is usually not the history of media but counted as such. As such, it did a really important work of writing in these sort of uh, practices that are not always counted as media practices. But I really wanted also to look at a bit more radical way of looking at deep times of media, not just the human transforms, transformations of materials into media, but the earthly transformations um, that already set the scene. So in a way, I want to continue through this. So Zielinski has given us a really good voc vocabulary about alchemy, technological experimentation, etc., etc., and deep time, but how to extend that into what I today also really briefly, it's a very brief take, kind of a, like want to pitch as an anonymous way of understanding the alchemist, the anonymous way of understanding transformations, right? And um, that's pretty much going to be my um, topic or focus in terms of the couple of themes that I'll talk through in a very academic style, apologies. Um, ooze. It's a beautiful world. So, planetary use is part one. Alchemy is often imagined and visualized as a sort of an early version of the mad scientist myth or mad artist myth, perhaps. The creative explorer who experiments with materials and minerals, who accidentally or perhaps incidentally comes across chemical reactions of new kinds by way of working outside the usual bounds of science, right? But what if alchemy itself starts with the planet? the soil, the underground, the various already existing chemical possibilities of transformations. What if the experiment, the scientific oddities are already part of the earth as an alchemist? What if the other stuff that follows is merely an after effect of what the planet itself, as an alchemist or an alchemist chemical laboratory, allowed 
This is, of course, an idea that several art performances and art practices, not least Martin Houses, has performed in various ways. We'll again today be able to um, join Martin Houses' performance um, half past four. I strongly encourage you to come there. But what I want to talk about is this, briefly talk about this scene of transformation. What if the scene comes before the alchemist comes? Let me elaborate. Recently, scientists have observed how the so-called Anthropocene period has also been marked by an emergence of new sort of life, or let's say burgeoning of new geological worlds of sorts, new sorts of chemical reactions that have caused a surprising increase in minerals. While partly emerging from earlier periods, this explosion of new minerals is strongly related to industrialization, not only, but strongly so, and the new chemical reactions these particularly important materials of technological culture have, have, have when they are oxidized or hydrated for long periods, and hence return to interaction with planetary materials and planetary temperatures. To quote from one of the sources of the news, I quote, these human-triggered minerals include calconatronite, a rare copper mineral that crystallizes as a bright blue crust on ancient Egyptian bronze artifacts, and an andersonite, a uranium-laced mineral with a fluorescent green or yellow glow that forms on the walls of mine tunnels. The bronze-hued apurite was discovered on the wreck of SS Cheerful, which sank off the coast of Cornwall, England, in 1885, and only formed because of chemical reaction between the salt water and the ship's sunken supply of tin ingots. So what seemed like, and we could continue with various examples, what seemed like random examples of particular bigger chemical reactions is actually something of a scale more vast than individual remains of technological artifacts or ships or even computer screens or other leftovers from the early record of media. It is more indicative of the massive rollout of metals, of mineral realities, of mineral births that the past hundreds of years or hundreds of years are leaving as their legacy. So the rusting metal remnants of an environmental version of Walter Benjamin's arcades, the place where you found the emergence of consumer capitalism becomes a different sort of a scene, less urban sometimes. Here the excavation is in the transformations of earth materials temperatures, chemical construction, as an investigation into the particular technological period of past 200 years, time stretches. If nothing else, this would be a rather apt way to start a science fiction novel of a synthetic ooze that starts to spread across the planet as an alien life, entering not from the outer world, but from the insides of the current forms of production of technological culture. But it's not necessarily alien life. This sort of a legacy of alchemy is mobilized across corporations and research laboratories, high-tech facilities, factories preparing electronic culture, and more. Instead of a science fictional ooze, why not call it corporate tech capitalism? You can also call it neo-colonialism. For such mineral worlds are also indicative of their birth as part of the research and conquest expeditions since the colonial time, since at least the 16th century mining operations, for example, in South America, as well as the neo-colonial arrangements that continue extraction industries to operate, still in South America for various things, not least lithium, for uranium in various parts of Africa, Australia, so forth, and other materials in search for the magic that ensues. The rhetorical alchemy, which seems to have fulfilled Zosimus's fourth century dream that he wrote in Greek as the divine art of making gold and silver, rings true in corporate orientation as to the place of technology in contemporary culture. In other words, let's not be mistaken, and let's not write out these underpinnings as well. With the appearance of more formalized forms of design and technology, the magical does not disappear. It gets integrated into a body of knowledge that operates systematically, and yet not without its various mythologies. It comes out in superstitions and misperceptions. It comes out in a mythologizing of the corporate and venture capitalist world of technology. Magic 
alchemy and impossible creatures like unicorns never really disappeared, did they? Also, secrets are still as precious as the formula for gold, but more often by way of legal copyright and other measures related to finance or state security, and magic is being conjured. But in new metaphorical disguises found both in marketing and in business parlance, secrets come in the form of algorithms as material ways of controlling money and information. Secrets come also bundled inside technologies. More broadly, one could speak of the technical media culture of past 100, 150 years as one of minerals, anonymous history of media. The massive change from prim primary reliance on just few key materials only over 100 years ago of wood and brick and iron, copper, gold, silver, 20th century plastics, of course, has been complemented, supplemented by a meticulous production, refinement and standardization of minuscule elements that are crucial for the microchipped technological society. It was already recognized before our time by Lewis Mumford and his 1930s account that the new technological period, indeed way before computers in the modern form, the new technological period will be one of new power sources of petroleum, of transportability of that power, but also of rare metals and metallic earths, as he described, tantalum, tungsten, thorium, cerium, iridium, platinum, and so forth. This for sure is not the usual media historical inquiry, but becomes a truly material way of understanding what media is as chemistry and how this is not merely a spectacle of, spectacle of awe and amazement, but also linked to the various environmental issues relating to toxic media waste. The fact that media technologies from screens to computers are made of metals and minerals, rare earth, other things, enabled, that enabled the planetary scale computation to exist is one important um, reminder as a sort of material, let's say, realization to something that was mistaken as the info, um, immateriality of the informational. In our case, in it, connected, it is also connected to a different sort of a story, which has to do with the planetary scale, the planetary scale laboratories of technological life. So true, of course, the alchemic imaginary, the alchemic imaginary of the lone genius has been replaced with the advanced teamwork laboratories that constitute the backbone of the magic of technologies, right? Or as Mercia Eliade reminded, the fact that chemistry took the place of alchemy doesn't mean that alchemy just disappeared. When faced with the superiority of systematic experimental sciences, as he put it long before our mineral media worlds emerged in their current planetary form, chemistry just accelerated this particular alchemic dream. I'm going to quote Eliade. The ideology of the new epoch crystallized around the myth of um, infinite progress and boosted by the experimental sciences and the progress of industrialization which dominate and inspired the whole 19th century, takes up and carries forward, despite its radical secularization, the millinery dream of the alchemist. Hence, cue in the laboratory planet. The term labor laboratory planet has been used already for, for some years now by the artist group Bureau d'Etudes and even Chardonnay. Under the term, the various newspaper publications and other um, um, things, they have curated a space of debate for the alien forces and chemical reactions that have turned the Earth into a planet-wide experimental space. Factories, laboratories, production and experimentation were always connected to the wider trade and colonial routes of material supplies, and these routes have mapped out across the planet as the wide-scale effects of both industrial pollution and the dead land, the dead water of extraction industries, to use Saskia Assassin's words. To quote Bureau de Détude, since World War, the planet is gradually transformed into a scale one laboratory. The old model of the world factory has given way to the model of the world laboratory. Object of this laboratory, can we also be subjects? Can we reclaim this huge machine that became autonomous, is now developing according to its own dynamic. Can we redirect the fate and direction of this laboratory? 
So they continue with a range of hypotheses, including about the various spheres of life that have been mobilized as part of the past 100, 200 years of political economic accumulation. According to their artistic narrative, the Earth itself is part of a cosmic economy, something we might call alchemy as well, because of the gold, water, precious metals, viruses, and other elements that contribute to fertilizing it, in their words, fertilizing it, so that the organic resources emerge. And of course, this is not entirely inaccurate at all, considering the reality of the Earth itself as part of a rather cosmic transport system of materials that territorialize on the Earth's surface and subsurface as the particular importance of the underground as one material repository for consumer technological culture as well. In this case, the Earth is an accumulation device accumulation device and a laboratory of sorts, of particular chemical compounds, which then itself support the emergence of different forms of life, both biological and non-biological. The Earth itself is an alchemical oddity, a sort of a background against which the variety of struggles take place. I quote once more. Earth would be then a place of socialization and acclimatization, of becoming earthling of alien entities and components. In this way, Earth could appear as a pirate spot, where treasures are gathered by the accumulation of accidents, positioning terrestrial society as a community of shipwrecked sailors building, either voluntarily or involuntarily, the future of their island. A pirate spot, or perhaps an alchemist's workshop, a chemical laboratory, but one also that is not merely about the high science and rational choices, but one of the weird events that are not merely about human powers of control, are they? The depth of media time is what connects to mineral realities, but also becomes sort of a non-human alchemic time. In some accounts, the digital is pitched as this contemporary form of creative alchemic material, substance, prima materia, the media labs as the sort of an alchemic laboratory where oddities take place. But more apt is to think of the actual mineral transformations as the alchemic laboratory that works through the periodic table, chemical engineering as the sort of a magic, at least the rhetorics of marketing has it so, the magic of technological age. Again, to echo Eliad, this sort of a transformational space is one of time as well. To exploit mines, coal, oil fields, and other forms of also non-fuel minerals as a synthetic production of materials, but also a synthetic production of an accelerated time that is piggybacking on the slowness of the planetary alchemy that brought it to us in the first place anyway. So perhaps it is important to understand the anonymous political realities of this alchemical reality. Not merely an evacuation of politics from the material transformations, but the necessity to think of the alchemist as a political figure or political force of technological culture that indeed builds on earlier traditions of trade routes, colonialism, what not. Not a celebrated individual only, but a conceptual persona of sorts at the crossroads of the transformational realities of acceleration, but also slowness of management of temperature as one particular media condition. Last very short section. In his novel Against the Day, Thomas Pynchon presents his own condensed lineage from alchemy to modern chemistry and technical media. According to his way of crystallizing the chemistry of technological culture, this transformation of knowledge and practices with materials corresponds to the birth of capitalism which is characterized by a regularization of processes of material reaction and metamorphosis. In the novel, a dialogue between the two characters, Merle and Webb, reveals something important about this turning point from alchemy to modern science. Hmm? I'll quote Pynchon's words. But if you look at history, modern chemistry only starts Coming, to, coming in to replace alchemy around the same time capitalism really gets going. Strange, eh? What do you make of that? Webb nodded agreeably. Maybe capitalism decided it didn't need the old magic anymore. An emphasis whose contempt was not meant to escape 
Merle's attention. Why bother? Had their own magic doing just fine, thanks. Instead of turning lead into gold, they could take poor people's sweat, turn into greenbacks, save that lead for enforcement purposes. Pynchon's realization is pretty apt, isn't it? Who needs magic if you, need, if you have enforced labor, slave labor, cheaply hireable men and women who can do the work of magic for you? The magical reality of effortless labor, things just appear like in the dream worlds of consumer fetish, is one part of the conjunction where labor and earth materials are written out of the, out, written out of the story and yet essential for its birth in the first place. These two realities of deep time of the alchemic planet and the social time of labor, colonialism, both internal and external, as in internal from our perspective, internal to austerity-ridden global north and the various ways of exploitation of global south, this is where they meet. The deep time is not merely that time that is buried inside the, deep inside the planet's guts, but a time that is constantly transformed, a time that itself is like a chemical reaction, quicker, slower, changing in shape, transforming into another, labor to gold, technological artifacts to mineral worlds of planetary ooze, a junkyard planet. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for UC? Yep. I'll just, you know, you're right in the front row, so. Uh, you're constantly talking about terrestrial uh, things. Um, at the moment, there's also a lot of talk of explore, exploring uh, the, the minerals on distant planets and comets and so forth. Yeah. Can you take those into account as well? Well, how would I guess you, How would you yeah. see that? There's a kind of a various sides to it as well. The sort of, a, you know, the extraplanetary fantasy is a weird sort of a fantasy that has its own political implications, right? There's a kind of a longer legacy to this, let's say, idea of, of leaving the planet, which is a pre very privileged white idea, right? Except, of course, astrofuturism. But in terms of mining operations, what I believe is that it's still very expensive, but it's a very emblematic of the ways in which, despite the kind of focus and the kind of a... Um, ideas of mining as something that is subterrestrial, in some cases terrestrial, for instance, through old ruins and infrastructures, is being extended to this sort of a outer spheres as well. So sort of a way in which some artists, well, like Trevor Paglen, but also others, have extended the idea that, of course, Anthropocene, if we want to use the term, is something that is around the orbit anyway. And we can, of course, agree that at least because of the satellites, it is already there. And in terms of the ways in which we produce knowledge, is already in a way captured partly, whether the real mining operations follow or not. But yeah, I think it's a good way of exactly reminding of uh, the necessity, necessity to think, despite my use of the words like geology, reminding that geology in this kind of a, almost like a Robert Smithson abstract sense, extends spatially, but also conceptually as well. I think it's still too expensive for them to actually kind of do anything relevant mining because they can get the stuff still, but let's see in the future. Some other questions? I wanted to ask you about uh, two things you said. You said uh, something along the lines of secrets can be bundled into technologies and that the lone genius has been repa replaced with advanced teamwork. And this idea of the lone yeah. genius disappearing into advanced teamwork came back uh, a couple of times. Yeah. Um, so that leads us to then, which is, I think is great, because to destroy the mm. lone genius is, is you know, well, let's face male it. male as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I All mean, like, look, there's lots of reasons to tear down this kind of archetype that, that exists. But at the same time, then we create a sort of uh, anonymous system wherein people can hide and take... Uh, less responsibility perhaps for the outcomes of their actions. Um, mm. They're just another cog in the machine. So, I mean, how does this, um, how, how can we unpeel these secrets that are embedded in technologies and understand better what is hidden in our phones and our laptops, uh, get to know these things? What are the tools? Um, yeah, it's a weird that jump from one thing to another, yeah, sorry. No, it's a huge question. It's a great question. I wish there was one way of doing that. That would be the easy solution. Um, 
because it's so, again, structured over time as well. If you start to look at the ways in which this sort of, uh, I'm, I'm doing work at the moment on laboratories, so which itself is a way too big of a topic. You know this well as well, that you know the contemporary enthusiasm of laboratories is sort of one form, but the ways in which it starts to build up as part of the engineering and other sort of laboratories which form the backbone of contemporary media for the 100, 150 years, to unbundle that structuration that is both architectural, organizational, political, and political economic is a huge thing. I mean, often I'm of the opinion, I'm sure that many of us share that, you know, quite often even if theorists and academics are blamed for not being political, but I think if you do that, in, you know, if you work in an educational institution, that's already a start. So one thing that we did with Garnet, Garnet Hertz, is that we constantly refer back to the micropolitics of these things, micropolitics of design. So one way would be through educational institutions as where we start to unfold the question through um, design which itself, as we know, is political, it's material, there's so many other things as well. That's not a you know, sufficient answer, but it's one among many, but um, yeah. Or as uh, my PhD supervisor, uh, Chris Cheeks at Mihai, likes to say that the, you know, he has an anecdote about learning about engineering education and seeing yeah. that there was no ethics involved. It yeah. was really like when he was making a choice between going to art school or engineering school, it was, well, that's scratching his head. This is strange, uh, you, you don't, question who the client is or what the yeah. client wants? No, that's not yeah. what you learn. So embedding this idea of micropolitics is definitely needed, not just in our fields, but in yeah, several others. And the really kind of, I mean, I know that we need to go forward, but one really interesting thing is that quite often the really gray and boring things like institutional politics and university policies relating to education and trying to address those levels of how I, doesn't engineering education also change in those ways? That will be even, sometimes even more effective, right? And that will be the really interesting things. That's why I always keep on saying that, you know, okay, I'm really sorry again, I used this joke before as well, but, you know, we, if you're in university, um, you know, academic, you probably, don't like your dean, right? Because they usually don't give you what you want, right? But actually, we need to get to really good people in those positions because we need to be really working also those institutions, right? So it needs to build into an institutional critique having to do with curriculums and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, Yusin. Thank you. Thanks.